Uh, voila, uh, thank you for the invitation to come to this beautiful city and uh, thank the organizers to take this very uh, important uh, topic of housing, affordable housing, which is a topic that we are discussing in most of European cities at the moment, out of different histories but with the same perspective as I think. Uh, my presentation will give you a very brief introduction in uh, housing, the housing history of my city of Zurich, which is a bit bigger than Ljubljana, but not that much. Then I will give you some figures and facts about the legal framework cooperatives are working in in Zurich. And then I will show you some pictures of the most recent very big project we did. And this also makes the bridge to the next speaker, to David Leuthold, who did some houses in this project with his office. Uh, uh, this is uh, Zurich, Lake of Zurich, uh, and the medieval town center that is uh, where the, the lake goes into the river and the city is sprawling down this valley and there is also kind of a, a building of a second city, so Zurich is developing into a bipolar city. On the left side you see the development that is between the medieval city center and the airport, which is at the moment a very dynamic region where the project I will show also took place. Uh, City, uh, Zurich is an industrial city. Uh, this picture shows you uh, very nicely how in the second half of the 19th century this uh, massive expansion of the city. On one hand side on the left with the factories and on the right hand side with the Gründerzeit development. So this very speculative mixed use developments uh, uh, Took the, took the space. It was also the first incorporation of Zurich, so the medieval city uh, tore down, tore down the walls and <coughs> sprawled in this swamp, in this, uh, in this valley, and building up the whole infrastructure of an industrial city with railways and roads and these huge uh, industrial sites. This naturally was linked with a very dynamic growth of the figure of inhabitants. It's comparable to what happens today in Southeast Asian cities. Zurich uh, grew from a small town with 30,000 inhabitants in 1850 to a big city of 200,000 inhabitants within 50 years. And this process naturally produced uh, huge uh, problems uh, regarding housing, so we have a history of 150 years of housing shortage in Zurich and there were also problems of hygiene, of density, of overcrowded, uh, very expensive flats. These conflicts uh, demanded solutions, there were political initiatives and in 1907 uh, there was a law that was voted by the uh, voters of Zurich, that forced the city to produce, as it was then called, cheap and healthy housing for the working class. So we have a long history of discussing what affordable housing can be, and this law uh, produced at the beginning that the commune, the city of Zurich, built the settlement we see here, this is communal housing, so this is one part of the housing provision for the lower middle classes for the working class, that the city produces housing itself. Then in the tents, uh, the, cooperative, the cooperatives took over. At the beginning it was mainly cooperatives that were linked with certain professions. So the railway workers founded cooperatives, the state agents founded cooperatives, the teachers founded cooperatives, just to provide for themselves housing. Sometimes, as in the case of this uh, settlement, the, this is a railway worker settlement, the, the Swiss National Railway gave the land and invited the people to build the house. 
Today, this is a, a, a listed building which was nicely renovated some years ago in the middle of the city. Then in the 20s, uh, I would say the very specific Zurich system developed, which you could say is a labor division between the local state, the city of Zurich, and the cooperatives that in these times grew quite strong. So the city of Zurich does the planning, does the infrastructure, does the hospitals, the schools, the, the roads. And then in the plots, as we see here very nicely, the, the grid was laid out by the city of Zurich. The infrastructure, this big schoolhouse, you see, uh, is built. And then the cooperatives are invited to fill up this prepared land with housing. There were much discussion about what housing cooperatives should build. In these times, there was a discussion about Garden City, also about production in these working class areas. So this quite low density housing, row houses with allotments that people could also produce some of the food there was kind of a, a main theme in the 20s. Then in the 30s, there was the second big incorporation. Zurich doubled its size, and this was a very strategic planning. So the world crisis was used by kind of left-wing uh, city government to buy up uh, old, in, uh, old farmland around the city. And this was meant as kind of slum clearance of the two dense inner city neighborhoods. So this is a plan of the 30s that shows that de-densifying the inner city areas with this row housing in this new incorporated belt around the core city should solve the housing problems. This was very strategically done. The, the plan you see on the left hand side was drawn by the building minister of the city of Zurich. Again, the city provided planning, provided infrastructure, and then cooperatives were invited to fill up. On the, re on the right hand side, you, you see, I think, a very iconic picture of the 50s, because all this was linked with a certain idea of how people should live together about the post-war society should be organized. You see, I hope you can see the mother on the bench with the daughter, two kids in this playground, a very, a very nice, a very green area, no traffic, no noise. This is a working class neighborhood quite close to huge industrial sites. So the father works in this factory and here this nice idea of a kind of, not really wealthy, but a healthy and, and, uh, and, and beautiful family life was promoted as a kind of social ideal. This picture felt in the 60s in a deep crisis. Uh, there were pull and push factors, so mass mobilization, mobilization allowed people to move out of the city to have this odd dream of the single family detached house in the agglomeration. So the city lost about 20% of the population, which also was linked with a sharp deindustrialization process in the 70s and the 80s and many crises the city faced. So this was kind of a deep crisis of this for this system, you could say, which affected heavily the city and needed new ideas to go on. Here you see the graph of the, of the inhabitants and this sharp going down uh, onwards from the 60s. The situation completely changed in the 90s. Then, in this permanently overcrowded city from, you could say, one day to the other, half of the city fell uh, as derelict land of the industry that, that left. And this opened completely a new field to discuss city development and also to, to discuss mixed use, to discuss the future of the city. 
It began with uh, small initiatives, people fighting against the destruction of working class neighborhoods in the city center. This is one of the uh, nicest and earliest example. Thank you. Here people fought four years against the destruction of this plot. There was a motorway planned that would run through this neighborhood. They fought for years against this and at the end they, this motorway project failed and they got the land, they founded a cooperative, they renovated the, some of the existing houses and built some additions. Then at the, at the end of the 90s, this movement uh, went out of the working class areas. I think this was a very important step. This is Kraftwerk One, the first project I was involved, where also young people said it's not about fighting in the inner city areas, it's also about this, but we should really develop more prospective ideas how to make the city bigger, you could say, how to find a future for this derelict land that 100 years of industrialization left to the city. This was a brownfield development, quite a self-confident one, a big one of a young cooperative that experimented in this project with new forms of living together with new forms of integration. There were handicapped people who lived there. It was one of the first big low energy buildings in Switzerland. And there is much about sharing, mixing, integration and density. There, I would say the main themes that bother us till today were kind of developed. It's about diversity. There is no standard solution for housing needs as the modernists meant in the 50s. There is a much more complex society we have to build for. There is about integration, there is about working and living, there is about sustainability. These new initiatives <coughs> together with the heritage we have from the cooperative movement of the 20s, the 30s, the 40s and the 50s now produced this pattern uh, in the, on the city plan. All the green developments are cooperatives. It's a wide universe of, of more than 120 cooperatives in Zurich at the red dots are uh, communal housing and you see this you remember perhaps this plan of the third is you see there is an inner city working class cooperative movement that is uh, added by this kind of horseshoe around uh, in this in this old rural villages these are the figures we call all together housing of common interest. This means cooperatives and communal housing. There are more than 120 cooperatives that own 40,000 flats. This means a market share of about 20%. So 20% more than 20% of all people in Zurich live in cooperative housing. And the share of subsidized housing is only 8% with cooperatives. Then you have the communal housing that is organized in communal housing estates and also in some foundations the city of Zurich founded to cater special needs. So all the elderly housing is organized as communal housing. There is even a foundation for families with many children. So the city reacted to different developments in society by, uh, by creating uh, foundations and this altogether is about 6% of the housing stock and you see much of these housing is subsidized. This goes back to the steel of the 20s where the city said okay we care for the people that are really in need that need help from the state and for 
most of this, let's say, lower middle class people who have some income, we just provide good conditions that they can help themselves. Founding cooperatives, putting money together, building their own housing. And I think this could be a very inspiring model to really decide where the state is needed, needed in which role, and where self-help and self-organization that then also is self-governing and a certain autonomy from the state can come in. This two system complement in a nicely way, I would say, and are very, very adaptive to new needs. So these 123 cooperatives all have a bit a different profile, a bit a different history, a bit a different uh, uh, group of people they address, and this system can adapt as we felt in the 90s to new needs. Just to give you a bit the legal framework, uh, I would say it's all about facilitation not so much subvention. This could also be interesting for politicians because they get much affordable housing with nearly no investment. <laughs> it's a voluntary contract the cooperatives make with the city of Zurich. They are private corporations, you could say. They even pay taxes as normal in corporations, but if they go in this system of, uh, of housing of common interest, they have some duties and some privileges regarding to the state. One duty is that they calculate their rents by the costs. They are not forced to have some four euros per square meter rents. They build their housing as cheap they can and then they calculate the costs of the rent by what they need to finance and to sustainably run the estate. There are no profits that can be taken out. All the shares are limited in value. It's not profiting from raising value of the shares, but from lowering rates, I will show. Also, the fees of the board of directors and everybody who works for cooperatives are limited on reasonable ranges. And if a cooperative fails, or if land is sold, then it goes to the state or to another cooperative. So the system is closed. Their uh, profit is not possible. Speculation is not possible. There is also, in the balance sheet, there is no re-evaluation of land values, so this 10 franc per square meter land that was bought in the 20s, today it's 10 francs. So it's not 4,000 as on the private market. If you do these duties, which are not very hard, then you get some privileges. And the biggest privilege is that every land that is sold by the city of Zurich must firstly be proposed to cooperatives to a defined price. So the city of Zurich is not allowed to sell land to private. There is also some help. Again, it's not subsidy, it's help. So the pension fund of the state agents of Zurich invests in cooperatives. If you as a young cooperative have a project, you don't have so much funding perhaps, you can propose your project to the city of Zurich and if they approve it, the pension fund of the state agents invests in your project. You have to pay an interest rate for this, which is a bit below market, but this makes it possible for, for instance, young group of people to do quite big investments with very low capital. Kraftwerk One, the project I, I, I showed you, was a 50 million euro investment, which was done by people with actually no funding. <laughs> There are also some control mechanisms, so we have to, to uh, depose our balance sheets every year to a certain office of the city that uh, looks after that there are no money taken out and stuff like this. And even the city of Zurich, you could say it's a privilege, you could say it's a duty, delegates one member in the board of directors 
in every corporate. There is, uh, on the land side, there is a, a system of, uh, of long-term land lease. It's not only this land on which cooperatives build, they buy also on the free market, but as I, as I told you, when the city uh, sells land, it has to offer it to the cooperatives, and this is done by the means of a long-term land lease contract. And in this case, the city can have other wishes they address to the cooperatives. Uh, the land value is defined. The city can, for instance, ask you to make some subsidized housing, to do some integration projects. They can ask you to do high ecological standards. Uh, they force you to do an architectural competition, always, that you do together with the city of Zurich to, to provide high architectonic quali quality. And they can even ask you to give to the city of Zurich some uh, areas for free for communal infrastructure, for kindergarten, for uh, communal facilities in your settlement. So again, it's kind of dealing together with the sta state. You get the land for a good price, but you have to provide something for the, for the sake of the whole community. Even art, we had to invest 1 million euros in art <laughs> in the project I will show. Uh, so the city can really steer a bit the community with this contract. And this is what happens financially. Uh, the blue uh, uh, curve is the index of, uh, the, of the interest rates. And then you start 40 years ago with a yellow curve. This is a private investment. And with a cooperative uh, project, which is the green curve. And the interesting thing is that at the beginning, cooperatives are not really cheap because they are not subsidized. Their construction cost is a bit the same as a private investor. But by the time the private investor takes up out money and raises the rent permanently to the market possibilities and the cooperatives who do this not, the rent sinks permanently. After 20, 25 years you are in a very, very cheap affordable range. This mechanism is, I would say, the success story of Zurich housing system because it runs like a machine without permanent statal intervention. And on the other hand side, for you, it's a bit a bad story. Because to build up such a system, you need a very long time. It's not, we decide today and tomorrow we have affordable housing. It's a very long-term story. If you would... Now you sold everything. If you would now go in another direction, in a, as we call it, the third way between owning and renting, then you have to rethink how you could do this step. And I think some investment of the state would be needed. Otherwise, you will not succeed. We had also our crisis, but I would say the last 10 years, the last 15 years, this uh, industrial, the industrial turn was successfully managed by our society and the city of Zurich now is uh, rapidly growing. It's a very successful city and also the cooperatives turned away from this just providing cheap housing to lower middle class families to the needs of a more diverse and complex society. These are some examples of recent housing projects done by cooperatives. And a bit like the first ones I showed you, it's again a very self-confident architecture, a very urban architecture. So it's not, uh, it's not uh, uh, doing it as cheap as possible. It's doing it as strong and as urban as possible. Beautiful projects were done in the last years, also architectonically beautiful projects. This is a, a huge settlement of two cooperatives on the fringes of Zurich. Just to 
end this up. I, I show you the project I worked on the last eight years, which is a very huge and very complex project and perhaps shows a bit where we are at the moment. It's again discussing about uh, industrial brownfield sites on the fringe of the city, very unattractive sites, nobody lived there, uh, four hectares, quite big. And there we discussed quite a lot of how to kind of invent urban quality in problematic sites. We discussed it on every level and the, this slide shows you uh, uh, how we did it uh, architectonically. We invited 25 architectural offices from Europe to propose kind of an urban idea of the site. And we invited these architects in the same step to show what potential for modern housing lies in their urban plan. So they were invited to make a master plan and to detail a house with some uh, flat typologies. And then we choose a master plan and invited three other offices to join in the master plan with their housing ideas. This is... Uh, a picture of the process that followed the competition. We now had five architectural offices, a general master plan idea, and many other ideas that were not always compatible. And you see it right in the faces of these people. So the, the woman uh, on the left is one of these young winning architects with their master plan, and the others uh, try to figure out how they can introduce their architectonic ideas in this plan. This was a process of about half a year, together with specialists, economists, sustainability people, where we tried to figure out what the potential of this plan could be. This phase ended with a little booklet the architects did, which was called Houses in Dialogue. And I think this is quite a, a nice story, that architects do not only react with, with plans and visualizations, but also with stories about housing, and that they really understood in this project that it's all about dialogue. If you try to really reinvent city, then you have to talk with many people. This is the ground floor pl plan at the end. It's also a very complex landscaping around these houses. It has much to do with diversity again and also with people coming in, taking spaces, arranging spaces and organizing themselves to make this place kind of high mod. It's a very complex architecture of 13 houses with about 370 <laughs> flats uh, and the idea of the competition, which uh, fascinated us uh, very much, was doing a bit the same on the level of the floor plan as they proposed on the level of the urban plan. So it's again 13 kind of entities that formed together kind of a flat. And the, the social idea behind this, that what is permanent in our society, society is privacy. We all need a room for us own. But the relation to other people, this is the thing that changes. And we cannot determine in the future. Perhaps we are in a family situation, perhaps we live together with some flatmates, perhaps we even need some care and physical treatment. And this structure, in a way, is open to cater all this different need in dividing it in smaller units or in uh, living the whole floor as kind of a big community that pr provides privacy but also allows uh, relations to your neighbors. It's m such complex configurations are only possible in a very discursive, participative process. So we discussed much about this project. This was in the on this uh, urban brownfield before construction work began. All steps in the project were public. Also, the jury of the architectural competition was a public event. So we have a very high 
uh, aspirations in in democracy and uh, and uh, dialoguing in the process. If you do it this complex, then the result is complex, but uh, very of, of a very high quality. Nobody uh, expected that we succeed in bringing in this periphery site of the city of Zurich. All you need, in a way, it's a bit it has some problems in converting the typography, but you see the, the vivid quality we succeeded. It's 1,200 people who live there in 160 different flats. There are some handicapped people, there is also an orphanage that is integrated, there is some student housing, uh, there is 46% of all households who do not have a Swiss passport, so it's also a, a very demanding integration project with it there. And it's much about flat sharing, uh, flu internal fluctuation, changing your situation to your actual needs. So it's one of the most affordable projects uh, we did in the last years in Switzerland. And for me, perhaps, the, the most important lesson is if you build for poor people, you have to do it very well. You have to do it with high architectonic quality. You have really to invest in public spaces. You have to, to share spaces, then a certain luxury gets possible. Uh, to provide the people a certain proudness of being there. Breaking up a bit the barrier between privacy and shared space, open spaces to community by respecting the private needs of the inhabitants. It's a, not a very luxurious standard we choose, but it's a nice flat, uh, well lit, simply materialized, durable. And there are spaces for adoption. And uh, so the landscape architects propose to leave some areas just open uh, for people coming in and deciding whether it's urban gardening or a bigger playground and what they do with their site. It is very urban. But we cannot uh, have urban qualities without accepting some closeness to our neighbors. It's uh, a controversy we, we have from the, from the modernist area. We decided to, to choose the European city, which I think is the future for living together in our countries. One year, this is one year, uh, the project is finished. People move on the ground floor, use the spaces, uh, discuss with each other, and I think this is what we can achieve with our profession. That was it from my side. Thank you. One question about the city selling the land. So how? If, if there's any land the city sells, it has to go first to cooperative. So, is there any other? How can an investor then buy land? Does it happen? No, naturally. The city doesn't own all the land of the city, as in Scandinavia, for instance. The city buys land also from the private market. They own some land from these incorporations, and only this land has to be firstly uh, provided to cooperatives. But naturally, cooperatives buy on the free, we have a private market, cooperatives buy on the, on the private market, and, uh, and real estate investors buy on the private market also. It's just a share of the land. It's okay. I have a question. Uh, it's me here. Oh. Uh, I was wondering, how do you define the structure of households per cooperative? Does it go along with the city or um, municipality? I don't know how it works. Uh, because n nobody knows how our society will be structured, or actually is. We just take 
the statistics of the existing society. It's perhaps a bit stupid, but we say if we do it a bit like the existing society, so we look at the ages. We, we built now 100 years for family, for small families. Eh? The, the whole housing system was completely oriented to small families. Actually, 50% of all households in Zurich are single person households. 75% of all households are single or couple households. <coughs> the classical family household is 14%. So in just reacting to these statistical figures and in not only providing family flats, you, I think you are in the right direction. And then naturally we learn from each project to the other uh, how to finally adjust and how to have this kind of non-defined spaces, I would say. So this cluster typology I showed you, this is an option for the future. We have built many conventional family uh, flats, but this cluster typology can perhaps become an elderly asylum, or kind of like this, or living uh, multi-generational households and stuff like this. So we just, we do not make a, a big flexibility, but we have some joker <laughs> spaces that can be adapted to future needs, to developing needs. So you actually integrate already in the, how to say, uh, when you put the regulation as a co cooperative, you put this uh, possibility of changing apartments into, if they become too big for, I don't know, single person, for instance, that they can change, or how does it work? Because I think in the longer term, maybe some apartments may become too big, it's too hard to This is a big advantage uh, on property of flats. The people who live there are all members of the cooperative. They buy shares. And then they are owners, in a way, of the whole development. But they are not owners of their individual flat. They pay rent. There are regulations that a uh, forum flat has to be lived by at least three persons. So if your kids move out, then you have to change the flat. The cooperative will offer you a smaller flat, but you have to change it. And in, in private ownership, you cannot do this. You are blocked. And this leads to a complete inadequate allocation of the resource uh, space. Thank you.